Today, we go deep into the dark forest of Ethereum. I'm gonna educate you on exactly how Ethereum transactions are processed and the great gas wars that have plagued the ecosystem since the rise of DeFi. Today, you're going to learn a lot about exactly how the Ethereum blockchain works, and you're gonna learn about a sleeping gem of a project that could completely upend the game theory that has been taking place on the Ethereum blockchain until now. Today, we're talking about Rook, also known as Keeper Dow. If you guys are excited to learn about a fascinating new sleeping gem on the Ethereum blockchain, then destroy that like button and remember that each and every comment on this video is entered to win your very own hardware wallet. Of course, I say that because Ledger just had their security breach and I'm going to be switching up the hardware wallets that I give out, but I'm actually curious what you, the community, think. If you guys would prefer me to stick with Ledger or to start giving out a different hardware wallet such as Trezor or some other brand let me know in the comment section below and you'll be double dipping because that comment will enter you to win. With that said, let's dive in. Now, before diving in and explaining what KeeperDAO does, we need to first explain a few different things about how blockchain works in general, especially for you folks out there that might not be as intimately acquainted with how the tech works. Now, you probably know by now that blockchain works by writing transactions into an immutable ledger, but there's something that happens before the transaction actually hits the blockchain. And that's when you submit your transaction and it's still pending. During that phase, which you can think of as transaction purgatory of sorts, this is called the mempool. Transactions sit in the mempool until they are written to the blockchain. And how it's decided on how transactions are written to the blockchain depends on, of course, incentive or money. And when you select your gas fees on Ethereum, you can choose to pay a lot or a little bit. And depending on how much you choose to pay, that will impact how quickly your transaction gets put on the blockchain. Because miners, the people who write the transactions, are highly incentivized to make the most money. They will always choose the transaction that's paying the most gas. This has led to a phenomena called the gas wars. Gas wars refer to when people keep outbidding each other with more and more gas to get their transactions through. This can actually result in some pretty exploitation behavior. Because if someone knows that a really important transaction is coming through, or there's a very important event, for example, a new token launching onto Uniswap at a certain price, if somebody wants to get, for example, a really, really big buy-in order before anyone else, then they can exploit the mempool and essentially outbid everyone to get their transaction in, scooping up tokens at a much lower price and sending the price of that token skyward before anyone else can actually get a buy-in. These gas wars can be highly exploitative, and for the most part, it's fueled by the greed of miners. Not really the greed, but just the natural human behavior that miners have to extract maximum profits. And so with this in mind, understanding that there are exploits going on in the mempool and the phenomena that is the gas wars, we can now introduce the Keeper DAO, which essentially is the first product that I'm aware of that really is designed with game theory and a bunch of intelligent code to essentially work against this exploitation and hopefully end the great gas wars of Ethereum. Now, if you just go to the, now if you just go to Keeper DAO, they would say that they're an on-chain liquidity underwriter for DeFi. They'll also say that they're a liquidity backstop with long convexity and a game theoretic optimality. Now, if you read this and you still didn't really understand what the heck is going on, that's okay because we're going to break it down for you. In fact, I found an amazing thread that we're just going to walk through because I think this breaks it down at a very simple level for you. And it's by a Twitter handle called Zero X Infinitum, who actually is the CEO here at Real Hexro, which is a derivative sort of gambling platform. Anyway, I'm not promoting Hexro. I never have. Just saying that this guy did a very strong summary here of what KeeperDAO is and why it's important. And I think after getting through this, you'll understand not only a lot more about the Ethereum blockchain, but you'll also understand that this opportunity for KeeperDAO is quite substantial indeed. So first, let's talk about the dark forest that is Ethereum. Like I said, before any transaction is written on a blockchain, the transaction first enters the mempool. Pending transactions sit in the mempool waiting to be selected and written to the blockchain by miners. Miners are paid a transaction fee or a gas fee in Ethereum's case for this service and will naturally select the transactions with the highest attached fees. 
very simple. They want to make the most money. There's no central source of mempool data, but advanced actors are able to assemble mempool data from multiple miners and the data can be used for a variety of purposes, as we were just discussing. While an average user may just select fast on their MetaMask when they're trying to get their transaction through, and no, I'm not staring into your soul when I say that, it's just the truth, most people just do that. Advanced users are opportunistic about gas fees. They'll check and analyze the mempool to ensure that their transactions are given priority. So they can literally specify the exact amount of GWEI, G-W-E-I, when you're selecting your gas fees on MetaMask for Ethereum usage. If you guys aren't using MetaMask, that might be a little bit of an advanced concept for you. But most of you out there, if you're trading altcoins and you're trading on Uniswap, are familiar with these concepts. If you know what you're doing here and you're technical, you can actually understand the exact amount of gas that will get your transaction through before another transaction or potentially the first transaction on the block. While most don't even realize that this is occurring, the elite few who run arbitrage and front running bots frequently exploit mempool data in order to ensure that they're able to capitalize on on-chain profit making opportunities. Again, if you think about this, if there's a way that someone can get their transaction through before yours, then they can potentially take advantage of it. If you're buying in at a certain price and they know that you've agreed to buy in X dollars at a certain price with certain slippage on Uniswap, then they can potentially get a transaction in before yours to arbitrage, to essentially buy at a lower rate and then sell it back to you. There's a lot of complex examples here that I could point to, but just understand that getting your transaction in first before others can come with significant advantages in this decentralized world that is crypto. This introduces the potential for gas wars, front running, and more. This war to front run certain high value transactions is something that is commonly referred to as front running, of course, but it also leads to a bidding up and up and up of gas. And that leads to something called a gas war, which tends to be a race that only miners benefit from. So understanding that this mempool of transactions before they hit the blockchain, how to prioritize them, how those priorities can actually in turn affect the blockchain, affect the prices of trades, affect and it's truly controlled in the end by miners, makes this a dark forest where miners are the apex predators and they can do a ton of things like reorganizing blocks, reordering transactions, dropping transactions, and all of these things can have real and material effects on your bottom line and everyone's money. So KeeperDAO here is attempting to burn down the dark forest. KeeperDAO is a game theory protocol designed to capture the maximum possible on-chain profit. KeeperDAO is like a mining pool for keepers and keepers are on-chain actors who manage liquidations, rebalances, and arbitrage on DeFi applications. Now, don't worry, we're gonna work through each one of these points individually. So they do this through three games. Now, in the case of Ethereum miners, the game's simple. Highest transaction fee gets written to the blockchain. Most money wins. In this case, we're introducing three games. The hiding game, the coordination game and the incentive game. And these three games together are designed to essentially eradicate this dark forest where miners essentially have ultimate power. So the hiding game allows users to route their liquidity through specialized proxies. These proxies automatically extract any profit that can be extracted from arbitrage or liquidation and return those profits back to the user. It's important to remember that miners can and will capitalize on any profitable opportunities that exist within the dark forest. Users and keepers hide these opportunities from miners by wrapping them in specialized on-chain contracts. So instead of the transactions just going onto the blockchain, the transactions are wrapped into special wrappers in the form of smart contracts that essentially hide them from the miners. So the miners are essentially not aware of the bids going on within the contract. These contracts restrict profit extracting opportunities to the keeper DAO, meaning instead of allowing for these profit extracting opportunities to be on the outside, they keep them on the inside. Keepers no longer have to compete with miners, a losing battle, and no longer have to compete with keepers who exist outside of the DAO. Through the concept of hiding, keeper DAO keeps trades and lending positions safe from minor exploitation. MEV or minor extractable value opportunities are then undercut and redistributed back to the users of KeeperDAO. And those users who root trades and loans through KeeperDAO will maximize profits and minimize losses. So essentially what you're doing is using specialized smart contracts to hide the value of the transactions from the larger mining mempool, which in turn allows for you to protect that ecosystem. And if there are arbitrary 
arbitrage opportunities, they're done within the system instead of outside. Instead of you being the benefactor, you can become the beneficiary. The second game is the coordination game. So that's the hiding game. We've hidden these transactions from the predatory miners, and now we're gonna talk about the coordination game. Now the coordination game is designed to incentivize arbitragers and liquidators or keepers to collaborate and share profits rather than fighting each other. Whereas in the outside world, keepers would typically watch profits evaporate as they increased gas costs to ensure that an opportunity is granted to them. As they bid higher, they lose more and more profits because they're fighting against each other instead of collaborating. Keepers now coordinate their actions and they earn more profits. It's sort of like, hey, if we all do this together, we all win together. That's the concept here, is that taking these front running and arbitrage and crazy opportunities that other people are exploiting you for outside of KeeperDAO, by participating in KeeperDAO, you become the exploiter. There are many opportunities for on-chain profit making where profits are eaten entirely by gas wars. By taking turns, playing the coordination game, redistributing profits, keepers can earn much more profit. So first it's about hiding your transactions from the exploitative mempool, and then it's about coordinating with all the other keepers so that we schedule out who wins in what order, and then those winnings all get chopped up and distributed. So the three goals here of the coordination game, the profitability of a keeper that is playing the coordination game must be higher than when the same keeper is not playing the coordination game. So they're essentially saying that if this is to work, you have to make more money by playing than not playing. This can't be based on altruism. Again, nobody's altruistic in crypto. No miner is gonna sacrifice fees just for something that looks better with optics or that feels better ethically. The only reliable guide of behavior in crypto has and always will be financial incentive. So it has to be financially incentivized or it will not work, period. So it has to be more profitable to play coordination than not to. It also has to be the case that the sum of the profitability of all the keepers playing the coordination game is higher than the sum of the profitability of the same keepers as if they were not playing the coordination game. Kind of saying the same thing as one, but going a little deeper. The relative profitability between keepers playing the coordination game is the same as the relative profitability between the same keepers as if they were not playing the coordination game. These three rules ensure that the coordination game rewards people in the right ways, in the right amounts, and at the right proportions, given that they're playing versus not playing. If you have any questions at any point during this, feel free to throw them in the comment section. And of course, if you guys are enjoying this knowledge and you're learning from it and you're growing your understanding of blockchain and this incredible technology, then do me a favor and give me a thumbs up. It's a great way and a totally free way for you to support the content and the channel. So now we get to the concept of scheduling. Now that we know that incentives are aligned, remember it's all about taking turns here in the coordination game. So scheduling now is the process of deciding who goes first. Keepers create identities on Ethereum through the keeper contract by bonding a certain amount of Rook. Now we get to the actual token of the keeper DAO, which is called Rook. And this is bound to their identity, or at least their on-chain identity, really their wallet, not like your driver's license. Every 100 blocks, the schedule is updated. The keeper in the first position is selected randomly, but the probability of selection is weighted relative to the amount of Rook bonded. So you can't completely exploit this system, but you can get a statistically higher likelihood of going first if you bond a higher amount of Rook. This process is repeated for every position in the schedule. There is a minimum bond threshold, which can be set by governance. Eventually, this thing will run completely on chain with no owners and really no moderators. Once the schedule is determined, keepers can behave as if they normally would, but without competition. They act in turn and can avoid gas wars and extract more profits by essentially being the single exploiter of any opportunities within the transaction. So, so if these sophisticated exploits are there, you know that you're not competing against other people to exploit them. Essentially, you will be the only predator around, if that makes sense. But you pledge to take your turn in being the predator. Everyone pays less to make more and redistributes profits. If a keeper acts out of turn, they can be voted out. Keepers can also vote to remove misbehaving keepers to ensure coordination. These incentives encourage keepers to share knowledge about on-chain opportunities so everyone can win and everyone can maximize profits. Together we stand or divided we fall. So the last aspect of the coordination game is performance. Performance is measured by the amount of profit a keeper returns to the shared liquidity pool. Rook is issued to keepers in equal value to the amount of profit returned to the treasury minus a governable 
total liquidity fee. The Rook is distributed to keepers proportionally to the amount of Rook that they have bonded. The performance of a keeper is compared against its bond. Underperformers lose part of their bond. Overperformers acquire the lost bond by underperformers. This mechanism results in priority scheduling for high-performing keepers. Keepers who are underperforming or inactive will eventually find themselves dropped from the schedule. So to recap here, after hiding transactions in special smart contracts, we coordinate the keepers so that everybody wins with the least amount of friction. And they do this by ensuring that there's more incentives inside the coordination game than outside, that those incentives are proportional. They also schedule out behaviors so that everyone goes and takes their turn, if you will. And then they also measure performance of the keepers to ensure that the people who are bringing home the bacon are rewarded most and those who are underperforming aren't overpaid. It's important that incentives Incentives are always aligned if you want things to move well in a decentralized ecosystem. And finally, we have the incentive game. This is the final of the three games that form the value proposition of the Keeper DAO. The point of the incentive game is that it incentivizes specific behaviors that are critical to the efficient and effective functioning of Keeper DAO. The incentive game is important because all actors in the Keeper DAO ecosystem must be properly incentivized to take actions that are advantageous for the protocol. Providing liquidity, bootstrapping, of the coordination game, playing the hiding game, and participating in governance. The Rook token is, of course, the heart of the incentive game. There are scenarios where it is useful to mint Rook, so it's important to realize a Rook isn't hard capped. It can be minted in specific scenarios, and that's to encourage users to provide liquidity for KeeperDAO so that users can underwrite the hiding game and leverage the coordination game. It encourages users to adopt the hiding game by rooting trades and debt positions through it, and it encourages keepers to join the coordination game and work with other keepers in KeeperDAO instead of competing with those keepers. And finally, to encourage active participation in governance. Throughout the lifetime of KeeperDAO, Rook will be minted and a proportion will be paid out to each activity outlined above. So all of these key behaviors that need to take place for KeeperDAO to function effectively are incentivized or disincentivized with Rook. There is governance here. Um, there will essentially be voting on specific things, the shape of the uh, emission curve, of distribution, keeper fees, liquidity fees, etc. Uh, and that's coming. And so this will essentially be completely community owned and community governed to ensure at all times that incentives are aligned properly. And finally, there are profits here. KeeperDAO collects profits through all of these games. And then this profit is rooted to a treasury that is controlled by the holders. And holders can vote to either fund development, incentivize participation and integration, or to just distribute fees back to rook holders, which to me is, sounds like one of the biggest opportunities here is just for distributing the fees that are generated by this whole system. Now, this project is a collaboration between Talo Systems and Amber Group. Talo Systems, the CEO, is the CEO of one of my favorite projects, as you well know, which is REN. Whereas Amber Group was founded by a ton of financial professionals from Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Bloomberg. Amber Group is funded by Paradigm, Pantera, Polychain, Dragonfly, Blockchain.com, Fenbushi, and Coinbase to the tune of $28 million. Essentially, this thing Essentially, this thing has some huge strategic background. It has an amazing blockchain mind in the form of the Ren CEO. It is also a complete first mover in the space. So adding to all of the interesting game theory is the fact that this thing has some ridiculously strong underlying fundamentals. Now, sizing up some price analysis here, we see Rook sitting at about $16 million in uh, total market cap. Um, and if we look at, the, at its sort of max uh, price chart here, it started in November. Rise at first sort of hit the market here and it was pretty much not known of it. Literally had $26,000 in volume, which is nothing, right? Got a little hype wave here and got sent up to as high as, you know, a little bit over $200, uh, $225. And it's really settled down here and it's really finding a base here around the low 60s, uh, mid $60 range. It's about as low as it's been. And you can see it's got that price chart that you kind of want to see, you know, finding some support here, uh, but it hasn't done the up and to the right thing yet. It hasn't caught a hype wave. Uh, and that's because I don't think a lot of people fully understand what this is or the potential of it, and maybe not enough people are using it. Um, but looking at the price chart, it looks like it's pretty settled, and really protecting the Ethereum mempool is a value prop that has a very, very high ceiling. It essentially could be used against uh, a majority of DeFi exploits. It could end up having a widespread integration. Looking at the price here, you know, the fact that it can make millions of dollars in just a few days, its market cap of 16 
$16 million. It does feel like there's quite a bit of room for it to grow here. It's only got about, you know, a million dollars in volume on it daily, or it's under a million dollars in volume on it now. It feels like the hype has really subsided here. And that's precisely when I like to get involved with and look at projects is when I think that there's huge potential. The tech looks interesting. The teams, the fundamentals stack up. And then the price seems to be uh, having a little bit of malaise, a little bit of sadness going on here in the chart uh, without a lot of spark. But you see price support here, right? The lowest it's ever been here uh, was about one third of what it is now. Um, so the lowest it's ever been was about $5 million. Makes me feel like you're not going to get totally dumped on here um, by people buying in, you know, 10, 20 X below you. The Rook token attempts to burn down the dark forest of the Ethereum mempool to take away some profits from bad actors who might be trying to exploit or front run your transactions and actually share them with you. By all joining forces, we can all enjoy the exploits together. So beyond the fascinating game theoretical examples that I painted out, I think that the token is sitting at a value that I could see growing dramatically, especially in the bull run that we're experiencing right now. It clearly doesn't have the hype attached to it. And I think a lot of people do not quite understand what's going on here. And certainly if enough people start using KeeperDAO, we would all start enjoying the benefits of the hiding game, the coordination game, and the incentive game together. It's a very interesting approach that I think could bring a lot of benefits to the DeFi community, to the Ethereum community, and beyond. And to me, if this thing catches on, the fundamentals are there, the team is there, the tech is there, it's been triple audited, it clearly makes a lot of money when it's being used. I'm pretty fascinated by what Rook is and what it does. It's one of the more original projects I've seen come out in the last several months. And while there's no guarantees in life, it does feel like something like this was bound to catch on, taking advantage of opportunities that are being really sucked up and monopolized by the select technical few who know how to exploit them and allowing for everyone to get in on them. It's a very interesting hypothesis and it's certainly interesting enough for me to get my own bag of Rook and start joining into this KeeperDAO community. But I'm curious, what do you guys think about Rook and KeeperDAO? Did you guys enjoy this type of episode that was kind of deeply technical? It was based on a lot of game theory, a lot more sort of deep education on the tech and the blockchain. And of course, a big thank you to Zero X Infinitum who put out this amazing thread that was able to summarize the benefits in a way that was digestible as unfortunately the KeeperDAO website was simply not able to do. Let me know if you guys enjoyed this. And of course, if you did, please give me a thumbs up. It's a free and easy way to support the channel. And remember, as always, each and every comment on this video is entered to win your very own hardware wallet. Again, tell me which kind of hardware wallet you guys want me to give out below. I'm happy to keep giving out ledgers if you want that, or I can switch over to Trezor or some other brand if you prefer. As usual, if you guys want to be made aware of coins like Rook or any of the myriad of coins that we've been talking about on this channel that have been performing exceptionally well, exponentially better than many top alts in the space, then all you have to do is subscribe and put that bell notification on. I make it a point to make sure that you are the first people to know about the coins I'm I'm interested in. There's no VIPs. There's no special groups. I do it all for my YouTube subscribers. So if you guys want an edge in the market and you want to know about really cool coins like KeeperDAO and Rook before they become mainstream hits, then all you have to do is subscribe. As usual, if you want to connect with me personally, feel free to follow me on Twitter or join my Telegram groups. The links for both of those are in the description. As always, I thank you so much for watching. My name is Elio Trades, and I'll see you very soon on the next episode.